Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm really excited to share about a topic that many of you might be a little bit aware of if you've been around for the past seven months. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the word coronavirus or COVID-19, but it's very relevant and something that has obviously impacted a lot of us. So when we think about this word of isolation, um, we, we've been learning a lot and how it's impacting our mental health. So we've learned how to live differently, how to love differently, maybe how to learn and experience our world in a different and new way. If you would have told me 365 days ago that I would be working from home with my dog sitting on my feet, that I would be hiring staff members without ever met, meeting them in person, if I would be living two miles down the road from my grandparents but not being able to give them a hug, I would have looked at you like you were a little bit crazy. Now, when we talk about this, this idea of mental health and isolation, it's something that's very relevant for us and something that most people are probably very aware of. If you haven't been impacted by this um, mental health uh, crisis, you've probably known someone that has. So when we think about this mental health component and its effect on our mental health, I wanna go over some, some brief statistics for you. We don't know a lot about the long-term impacts of what COVID-19 has done to our mental health, but we do have some research that's come out from multiple, for multiple different studies and universities talking about different ways and unique ways of leveraging social media and being able to use technology to build that connection with one another. We have studies that um, have come to show uh, levels as, as much as 50% for anxiety and depression and uh, those suffering from PTSD symptoms across multi, um, many different industrialized countries. And being a mental health therapist, I typically work with children and adolescents. That's usually where, where I thrive. But this is something that's been new for me is we don't typically think of children and adolescents dealing with isolation because they're typically with a grown up, they're with an adult and someone that they care about. And so this has typically been something that we have focused on with our older adult population and those who may be suffering from an addiction. But we do know the importance of, as a social worker, one of our core values is the importance of human connection and, and the importance of human relationships. So when we think about that, obviously we have to look at things new and differently and going off of this TED Talk, um, being creative and unique and finding ways to connect with one another. So I want you to think about your life here for a second, do a little bit of introspection. I want you to think about a time when you felt this word before, this word of isolation. Maybe it's been within, within the past seven months of dealing with COVID. Maybe it is when you had a spouse leave you. Maybe it is a time that you lost a loved one or you moved to a new city or you're the only person in your community that thinks a certain way. I want you to think about what those thoughts and emotions and feelings have been, and I want you to hold on to those. But before we get started with some of the tips and tricks that I hope you guys can take home from today, I, as any millennial would do when I was trying to research and find some ways of conceptualizing this idea of isolation when isolation is our only option, I went to social media and I pulled up some different, um, if you could go to the next slide, please some different things that maybe uh, people have run into. So these are responses that some of my friends and family gave to me. And I think some of them are all very relevant to some of you as well. So thinking about having lack of in inaccurate information, missing physical touch, being distanced from people, having not being able to meet a new family member, a new baby in the family, fatigue from worrying about other people. All of these things, I think we can probably make the list go on and on for things that we've, we've been dealing with. And I think it's very interesting um, as we think of this concept of isolation, um, and if you go to the next slide that I need to differentiate when we're talking about this, is the fact that isolation is very subjective. And when we talk about isolation, isolate, isolation does not mean that you feel alone because sometimes we can be alone with ourselves and be okay with that and we might need to do that. But this idea that isolation is being subjective is I could walk into a room with 25 people and feel that I don't belong there or I don't fit in where I could have a friend go with me and feel like they are having the best day of their life. And so when we think about this concept of isolation, we want to think about how that is subjective and the ways that it impacts our world. 
So I don't really just want to talk about the issue. As a therapist, I always like to help solve problems for people. Obviously, we listen, but we also like to solve problems. So with this, I want to go to the next slide and think about this concept of what do I do? So when I'm working with a lot of my students, I frequently have them draw two circles on a piece of paper. The first one being a smaller circle, the second one being a larger circle. And when we talk about that, we, I, I consider it different circles of control. The one in the middle are the things that we can control in our life, and the one on the outside are the things that we cannot control. Obviously, with a worldwide pandemic as individuals, there's not a lot that we can do to control the fact that COVID-19 is spreading. But as individuals, we can focus in on that, um, that area and that circle of control. So that's what I'm hoping that we can do during our time here this evening to be able to focus on what are things that we can control. And it's going to be our connection with others, our connection with ourselves, and our connection with our environment. So if you go to the next slide, please, our connection to others. So what does this look like? As I said earlier, as a social worker, this is the epitome of social work and mental health and psychology is our connection with others and how our mental health is directly impacted by our connection with other people. So again, we've had to be creative and we've had to find new ways of connecting with other people. So it might be a socially distanced gathering outside where we typically would maybe spend some time in a loved one's home. Maybe we are having to have a drive-by birthday party. Maybe we're having to do video calls now instead of being able to go over to our friend's house and spend time with them. We've had to find different and unique ways of being able to come up with ways to remain connected during our time together. So when we think about our connection to others, we need to find those unique ways of doing that. So that might be um, writing a letter to someone that you've missed. It seems a little antiquated, but it's something that can really help feel, the, feel that connection and be able for you to feel connected with yourself as well. Sticking to a routine with your family. So if you live with uh, a group of family members, being able to sit with them on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday and say, hey, we're gonna have to dinner together and we are going to spend time with one another. Or maybe even trying to find a thing such as this TEDx talk of going to a drive-in movie or some sort of new and creative way of remaining connected with those that we love. So we've talked about a little bit of our, our connection with others, but we also need to worry about our connection with ourselves. And this can sometimes feel a little bit scary because this is when we have to think about what's going on in our, in our world and really be introspective and think about that. So when we think about our, our connection with ourselves, I want you to think about what emotions are you feeling? What is your body telling you? Do you need to rest? Are you feeling anxious about a new situation? Are you feeling sad that you aren't able to see loved ones that you typically would wanna see? Typically, a lot of us are in overdrive right now. We aren't able to conceptualize what this worldwide pandemic has been like and our brains are not made to be able to do that. And so a lot of us are, are putting ourselves in overdrive, working extra hours or finding new um, things to get to keep our bodies moving. But being able to focus on your emotions and your bodily sensations helps with emotional regulation and your ability to regulate what emotions you're experiencing and then how you can take that and build that resilience within yourself. If you're a parent, this is the key to being able to help your children too, to be able to regulate yourself as a parent and being able to help your child regulate themselves through this process as well. Sometimes it may take a little bit of extra, not just introspection for yourself. You may need to get involved with a therapist. I have my own therapist as a therapist and my therapist has a therapist and their therapist has a therapist. So sometimes we need to reach out to professionals and be able to ask them questions and have them listen and to be able to have them give us tips and tricks and be able to build some of that resilience within ourselves. This third point that I wanna make is our connection to our environment. So when we think about our environment, I want you to think of a space that makes you feel safe and at home. It could be in your home. It could be a favorite vacation spot. It could be somewhere that you remember from being a child, anywhere that you feel comfortable and safe. And when you think about that, I want you to think about the different sensations that you can experience in that time. So for example, if I'm thinking about being in my living room, I might hear my dogs chewing on their bones while I'm binge watching Grey's Anatomy because that's the best show that's ever existed. Or maybe we can smell dinner cooking in the uh, kitchen, or maybe we can, obviously we're watching Grey's Anatomy. Maybe we're feeling a soft blanket sitting on top of us. Being able to feel those sensations, connecting with our environment and connecting with the space around us can be very helpful for us to be able to um, connect with ourselves and be able to feel a little bit more resilient and calm in that situation when a lot of times we feel out of control. 
So I typically like to focus on some positive things. So I went back to social media and I asked my friends and family, what were some positive things that came from dealing with COVID-19? And I want you guys to take a look at this and see if any of these things resound with you or if there's anything that maybe you might be surprised by. But something that I noticed when I was looking at these, and I did not plan this, so I was actually very surprised that it happened, was there are examples of our connection to self. There's examples of our connection to others. And there's examples of our connection to our environment. And when we think about these, how we have been able to move through that time of feeling isolated and how we have moved forward and built that resilience. So now moving forward, what do you, we are gonna talk about doing what you need to do. So this can sometimes be very difficult for people to set a boundary and to be able to say during a pandemic that I might not be able to um, work or be the best partner or the best caregiver that I can be, but I need to focus on myself. So when we're focusing on ourselves, that might mean saying no to someone. It might mean, um, you know, taking on a new hobby that allows you to de-stress and be able to connect with others or yourself or your environment in a better way. So I want us to take us back to that, that beginning thought of when I, I asked you to think about a time when you felt isolated and think about what got you through that time of isolation, or maybe you're currently going through it right now. But I want you to think about, was there something that you had to do to connect to other people? Did you have to talk to a friend or a therapist or seek um, you know, professional help from somebody else? Did you need to connect with yourself and figure out who you were outside of that relationship or in who you were in that new city or um, who you were in terms of what your belief system was? Did you need to connect to your environment in a different way? For me, I started a garden when COVID-19 started and I have tomatoes out the wazoo now. Um, and so being able to um, know that, that being able to connect with ourselves and with others and with our environment and the impacts that that can have on us. And I want you to remember this last slide here real quick is that you are not alone. Earlier, there was a speaker that said there are 7.8 billion people in the world. No one is immune to going through COVID-19 right now, and this is something that we're all struggling with together. And as I was um, preparing and trying to find a way to wrap up this, this talk, I found a beautiful poem that was written, um, and I wanted to share it with you, and it is called In the Time of Pandemic, and it was written by Kitty O'Mara. And the people stayed home, and they listened and read books, and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still. And they listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced. Some met their shadows and the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. Thank you.